Um, welcome everyone. Um, my, my name is Charlotte and I'll be presenting today along with my colleagues. Um, today we're going to be talking about how to work better with nature to support a green recovery in the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. But before we kick off, we're just going to play a video to set the scene for you. Thank you, Tara. Uh, the video will be coming shortly. Just hang on a second. Everything is connected from the tiniest of insects to the largest of forests and everything in between. When an ecosystem is in balance, all the plants, animals and the communities that live within it can thrive. But when trees are cut down and land is burnt, the soil loses fertility and its ability to sustain life, leading to erosion, destructive winds, droughts, flooding and a loss of biodiversity and consequently suffering for the world's poorest people. But hope is not lost. Just waiting underneath what appears to be barren landscape is an immense underground forest, ready to regenerate into a productive ecosystem. Farmer-managed natural regeneration teaches communities how the simple act of pruning can release the untapped energy of deep underground root systems, rapidly turning small shrubs and stumps into mature trees in a matter of years, completely transforming the world around them. When we apply this low-cost and very effective technique to much larger areas, something amazing happens. More trees mean less soil erosion, wind and heat damage, trapping moisture in the soil and restoring fertility, so farmers can grow bigger, healthier crops. More trees mean more feed for livestock, giving farmers healthier, more productive animals. More trees mean more firewood, timber and hay, which can be sold to diversify income and create new investment opportunities in the community. As habitats begin to regenerate, businesses like honey production become possible, as do previously unimagined income opportunities such as ecotourism and even trading carbon credits. Everything is connected. All the wonderful, tangible outcomes created benefit not just the environment, but the communities who depend on it for their survival. Families can put more food on the table, earn and save more income, build better houses and send their children to school, helping to break the cycle of poverty. Natural regeneration is a catalyst for sustainable development that leads to a brighter future for the next generation. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, we're about to begin. We just had a little video there for the people coming in a little bit late. Um, we'll put the link to the video in the chat. Um, but before um, we begin, I would like to do an acknowledgement of country. Um, and so I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land on which we meet today and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today in this, um, at the conference. And I would like, like to particularly like to acknowledge the deep connection that First Nations people have to land, sea, sky and waterways. As much of what we will discuss today in this presentation will highlight the importance of that connection. So today I'm speaking from uh, Gia country up in uh, northeastern um, Australia. 
let's go to the next slide. Sarah, are you sharing your screen? Um, I can't see the, the slide moving. <laughs> my one's got the three of you on my screen. Is that what other people can see or has something gone a bit awry? We can see your screen, Sarah, but you're going to need to play uh, to click the icon to uh, display the slideshow at ah. the bottom. It's displaying the slideshow on a different screen of mine. Sorry, give me one oh, moment. <laughs> Hang on, sorry, everyone. Let's start that again. Okay, I think it's starting to come through. Okay, excellent. So um, welcome everyone. Um, so today um, we're going to look at how we can work with nature to support a green recovery in the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. So whether you're new to this topic or someone with experience, we hope you'll be able to share and learn together and come away with a better sense of purpose on how we can use nature-based solutions to address a range of societal challenges. So today I'm pleased to present um, along with my colleagues from World Vision Australia, um, World Vision Australia is a global leader in a game-changing nature-based solution and practice, which we'll talk about a bit later. Um, but presenting and facilitating alongside me today are Tony Renato, who's worked in the climate action and resilience space for more than two decades. Uh, Tony is also known as the forest maker and is a recipient of the Right Livelihood Award for his efforts in supporting regreening in Africa. We also have my colleague Sarah McKenzie, who leads World Vision's technical approaches as in um, technical approaches in ecosystem restoration. So World Vision, um, we're committed to working um, on um, these issues and we have an excellent track record working with nature to address a range of societal challenges from climate change, disaster risk, economic and social development, human health, food and water security, environmental degradation and biodiversity loss. So we're gonna take you through the presentation now. So next slide, please, Sarah. So let's begin. Um, the last 18 months has seen a massive global disruption with the emergence of COVID-19 and we're not, uh, not out of the woods yet. Um, World Vision with many other organisations has been part of the global response to address the primary and secondary impacts of the crisis. In addition to our efforts to provide health, education and livelihood support to children and their families in affected countries, we have also been thinking about how to respond and recover in ways that are more sustainable and more resilient. One output of this work has been the development of a green recovery framework, which I will present briefly now. Next slide, please. So COVID-19 is a timely reminder of the important connections between healthy and resilient natural environments, human health, well-being, and economic prosperity. And when economic growth comes at the expense of the natural environment, we, we see now that human health and well-being suffer. So the sharp rise in zoonotic diseases, those diseases that transfer from animals to humans over the past 50, 100, sorry, the past 50 years coincides with unprecedented human encroachment on the natural environment. So deforestation, unsustainable agricultural development, um, climate change and the expansion of human settlements have led to a significant decline in natural ecosystems around the world. And this is threatening children's rights to a clean and healthy environment. Next slide, please. So children's well-being is at risk. So as a child um, rights organisation, um, we see these impacts. So as a result of COVID-19, in many cases, children have experienced heightened food insecurity, increased risk of violence, neglect, abuse and exploitation, and the interruption or total breakdown of essential services, including formal and informal education. So the UNFPA predicts 13 million additional child marriages will occur in the 10 years following the pandemic with at least 4 million girls married in the next two years alone. So overall, the UN estimates that COVID-19 could push an additional 42 to 66 million children into extreme poverty, which will curtail their rights uh, for an adequate standard of living, access to sufficient nutritious food and social security as enshrined in the UN Convention on the Rights of Children. Next slide. 
So just a bit more background on why we need a green recovery. Um, next slide. Child, uh, climate change is a threat multiplier. So um, COVID-19 is not happening in a bubble. Um, we know that climate change is here and the extreme temperatures we've seen in the last few days around the world is yet another example. Um, in 2020, more than 500 million children live in areas of extreme high flood risk due to cyclone storms and rising sea levels. And over 1.3 billion people live in degraded agricultural land and 2 billion people suffer food insecurity. And we've been told many times that the climate crisis risks reversing 25 years of gains made in child health and against child mortality. So if we do not urgently mitigate climate change and restore the natural environment, this crisis will only deepen. Next slide. So science tells us that time is running out and we're at a tipping point where the planetary boundaries necessary for the long-term survival of our species and the planet are being crossed. So if we fail to act, crises like COVID-19 could become the new normal. And this prompts us to ask how we can build back better so that we have a greener, stronger and resilient community and where no child is left behind and where the earth our only home is cared for. So this uh, takes us to the next slide, which is um, about what is a green recovery. So a green recovery from COVID-19 um, supports children's, families and communities recovery from the immediate impacts of the pandemic. And it builds longer term social, environmental and economic resilience to future shocks and stresses. It's a holistic framework for recovery. And as you see on the right of the slide, there are six um, elements to the, um, to the green recovery. So at the top, we've got realization of global goals. Um, next to that, we have um, social protection. So this idea of strengthening and expanding social protection programs so that children and families can meet their basic needs. Then we've got participation and social accountability, which is around creating solutions that reflect the needs of vulnerable children, families and communities by strengthening their participation and social accountability mechanisms. The next one at the bottom we have is food security and sustainable food systems. So that's investing in food security and sustainable food systems so that communities can access sufficient nutrition um, for food now and into the future. I'll just pop up to the top um, left hand side, um, community centered disaster risk management. I think most people know what this is, but it's around making sure that people are able to prepare and respond for future shocks and stresses through climate smart means. And the last one, uh, which is the one we're going to focus on um, today is the nature based solutions. So nature based solutions is about working with nature rather than against it by employing set, um, nature based solutions. Um, so that um, we can have uh, benefits for people and the planet. So we'll just go on to the next slide and explain a little bit more about nature-based solutions. So for those who don't know, nature-based solutions are actions to protect, sustainably manage and restore natural and modified ecosystems that address societal challenges effectively and adaptively. So these are solutions that simultaneously provide human well-being and biodiversity benefits. So when you hear me say, uh, benefits for people and the planet that's what we mean and they address a range of societal challenges so you can see um, the down at the bottom in the blue in the circles there's some examples there so we've got climate change mitigation and adaptation disaster risk reduction economic and social development human health food and water security environmental degradation and biodiversity loss so these types of solutions include restoration, protection, management, and they can be very much issues specific. So we'll move on to the next slide, where we've got some examples of some types of nature-based solutions. So this is what they might look like in practice. So we've got some examples here, mangrove restoration um, to protect against erosion and storm surges. So we'll see that in, um, in the Pacific in particular but also lots of places in Asia. Um, natural wetlands to support better water quality and biodiversity. Um, constructed wetlands to remove toxins and contaminants from urban runoff. And also they provide habitat for wildlife in more urban areas and community recreation. We've, at the bottom, we've got um, some reforestation um, and some of the benefits there is this sequester carbon, improving air quality, reducing landslides and increasing water security. And then natural regeneration, which is the last one that I'll share, um, which is to support food security and fodder production. 
So these are just some examples of nature-based solutions. There are many, many more, and um, we'll go into those in a bit more detail, but I'd like to pass over to Sarah now who will tell you a little bit more about one particular nature-based solution that World Vision has been working on for the last 20 years. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Charlotte, and hello, everyone, and my sincere apologies for my shoddy job of screen sharing so far. I think I've got things figured out now. So I'm going to be talking to you about farmer managed natural regeneration, which I will keep using FM and R to refer to from now on, so this doesn't run over time. So what is it? It's a nature based solution. So Charlotte's given you an overview of what they are. It's when we're harnessing nature to combat climate change. Um, but it's a lot more than that. It's a simple, low cost technique that communities can use to regenerate their environment. Um, and not to put things too oversimplistically, but I think myself and my team are big believers that when the environment thrives, the community can thrive. So the technical practice involves regenerating trees from tree stumps that are still alive or actively managing new trees starting to grow from wild seedlings. So I'll show you an image on the next slide that explains what I'm talking about there. And as you can imagine, when community members begin to practice this, they see a really rapid increase in tree density. And I'll go into the benefits of that increase in a moment. So this is what it looks like. It's really, really simple. So you'll probably notice now when you go for walks that you'll see things like this sprouting stump on the left. So likely in the past, that was a big tree, like the ones you see in the background. But when it was chopped down, um, it's trying to come back to life. So sending up all these shoots, but with a little bit of help from humans to cut off those surrounding ones and focus on some um, tall, strong and straight ones in the middle, you see that rapidly turning into a tree in a matter of years. And in a little bit later, um, Tony's gonna explain to you how we um, work with the community to get them on board with this practice. But one of the main benefits is that you see a much, much higher success rate doing this because you're using existing natural living tree stock. So you get 95 to 100% success with this. Whereas if you're tree planting, it can be as low as 15% survival rate. So um, it's a smart nature-based solution as well. So I know you're all passionate about research. Uh, so I thought I would share some of the results from a meta review that we did of eight key FMNR projects. So as I said, up the top, you can see that we are really aiming firstly for an increase uh, in tree density and particularly the trees that the farmers and community members want. So whether that's to uh, improve vegetation and soil quality, if they're planting something like crops, uh, or whether it's they're wanting more fruit uh, or habitat for bees, for example. But a meta review found that 80% of those who hear about FMNR go on to practice it, which I think is pretty incredible. They were 15% more likely to report an increase in the availability of firewood. Um, and it should be noted that it's not always used for firewood, these branches, it could also be for building um, or other purposes. And then we see that now that you've hopefully got more trees, you've got better soil, hopefully you're therefore growing more crops or more animal fodder. Uh, and then you're able to both consume that and sell it. So the households in Kenya, Rwanda and Tanzania who were investigating this were 22 to 24% more likely to report an increase in household income from practicing FMNR. Uh, and then we're looking at those bigger benefits. So the households were 8% points more likely to be able to provide well for their children. Um, so it's more than just trees, I think is the, uh, the takeaway from this as environmental, social and economic benefits from increasing tree density. Uh, this just shows you a few images of some of those even bigger benefits, um, especially the environmental ones. So we're looking at reduced species extinction, uh, we're looking at reduced irregular migration because you've now got a more fertile land for the community uh, to grow and live and thrive within, improve water uh, and climate change mitigation and adaptation. This is just a snapshot of the SDGs that FMNR contributes towards. So again, just really hammering home that idea that it's more than just the environmental benefits. You know, we're looking at 
the increased food availability. A really interesting one is gender equality. So in most of the countries that World Vision works in, uh, it's women who end up collecting firewood. So if we're reducing that collection time, that is freeing up time for women. Uh, and also looking at uh, some of the land productivity ones and resilient communities and landscapes. And what's happened with FMNR so far, it is now practiced in at least 27 countries. Um, and we're really proud that World Vision is a global leader in this, but many others have started to adopt it. Uh, in Niger, FMNR has regenerated 26 million trees over 6 million hectares. Uh, we've had over 200,000 people trained in FMNR worldwide, uh, and we've started to do some carbon programming with FMNR. So, particularly in Ethiopia, our Humbo project has sequestered 81, 181,650 tons of carbon, and Soto 94,817 since 2007. And I think the coolest thing about that is not just the carbon sequestration; it's the fact that the community members profit and benefit from the sale of carbon credits. So it's really going back into those communities that are reforesting and regenerating their environment. That is a bit of an overview of the technical practice itself, but the much more important thing is people and how this connects to them. Uh, and so I'll hand over to the forest maker, Tony. Thank you, Sarah, and good afternoon, everyone. So applying nature-based solutions requires a recognition that the degradation was caused by human behavior in the first place. And if we're going to re restore environments, ecosystems, it foremost requires a change in this destructive human behavior. And, and so even though I have a technical background, 95% of my time is not spent on technical issues of trees and nature-based solutions, but on working with people. And whether through ignorance, or because of poverty or sometimes perhaps greed, people are at war with nature. And my job is to turn enemies of nature into friends of nature. And so this, this man here, Marimo, I met him in Tanzania, and he said to me, this tree used to be my enemy. And after cutting it every year, I tried to burn it, I tried to destroy it. And you can see the bowl there where he's lit the fire every year. And then I learned about the importance of trees. And today I'm so ashamed. Now I'm doing everything that I can to save it. And it actually turned out to be a very valued and highly sought after wild fruit. So he, he's benefiting and, and he's doing all that he can in the community to, to turn that attitude around. Sec, uh, next slide, please. So at, at the heart of human behavior are beliefs. And so the way that I approach nature-based solutions is by patiently and respectfully challenging false beliefs and negative attitudes about trees and about the environment. And I, I feel if I can convince uh, communities and parents that it's in their best interest, that they'll have a better future for themselves and their children if they work with nature instead of always fighting it and destroying it, then that they will have that better future that they wish for. And what I've noticed as I've traveled around the world that is that every parent wants a better future for themselves and for their children than the current reality than they're, that they're experiencing. So I work with that desire and I invite communities and individuals to come on a co-learning journey of discovery in restoration. And uh, just, just a little on community. So why all this emphasis? When you think about it, their livelihoods and often their very lives depend on the health of the environment that they live in. And so they have the most ex at stake. They will be the most motivated to make this work. And so we, we learn from traditional knowledge and try to build on that. We build capacity with the knowledge that we've gained over the year. Over, over the time. Very often it requires advocacy to government to create enabling laws. In most places, people do not actually own the natural resources that they depend on. And this is debilitating. If they have user rights or ownership, then they have the motivation to protect it and to use it sustainably. So we, we very much try to work with communities. And in fact, I would say success or failure 
hangs on how well you do that. Next slide, please. So in, in the 1980s, I developed and popular, popularized this FMNR method. And in the first 20 years, it actually spread with, with minimal intervention on my part. It spread from farmer to farmer at a rate of about 250,000 hectares per year until there were 5 million hectares at that time and uh, about 200 million trees. Ne next slide, Sarah. And the impact has been very, very significant. These slides were taken in 2017. And so food security has increased. And in fact, farmers in Niger today are growing an additional 500,000 tons of grain every year without fertilizer, without better seed, uh, without irrigation, just by virtue of the fact of working with nature. Their gross income has increased by about $900 million every year. And their resilience has increased because as you can see a little bit in that slide, now I won't go into the detail, the crop and livestock diversity has greatly increased. They're no longer relying on a narrow range of annual crops in an environment that's biased against them. And the man in the middle there, this, this is Yauza. In 2016, his whole, well, the whole district suffered crop failure, but he was regenerating a particular tree, apple of the Sahel. And we taught them how to graft an improved cultivar. You can see the difference in the size of the fruit in that left photo. Even though his food crop failed, he sold his fruits for $400. With that money, he spent $200 on sheep, fattened them, sold them for $790. With that money, he was able to buy the grain that he needed, put his children in school, meet health needs, support relatives, and buy a motorbike to boot, all with that little bit of money generated from the fruits. So, but what's the context? When you think of Niger, one of the poorest countries in the world, at that time when we started this program, no government support and our organization, I wasn't with World Vision, it was a very small uh, organization. And they regularly experienced food shortages, severe hunger, and there was out migration. So that, that's totally turned around through working with this nature-based solution. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I just want to elaborate on the example that um, Sarah gave with some of the photos in her slide. This is Humbo in southern Ethiopia. And uh, in 2004, we initiated a program with the community to restore the degraded forest on that hill. And the back history is, for 20 years prior to that date, this community was food aid reliant. Every year, to some degree or other, they were receiving food aid. And uh, again, that, that drought flood, um, al alternating drought flood each year, children not in school, subsistent agri subsistence agriculture, and mostly the men having to migrate every dry season to look for work. And at first, when we introduced this, there was great resistance to the idea. There was fear. We would lose our grazing rights. We won't have access to the fuel wood we need. We'll lose our land. And so it was so important, again, to work with the community and particularly the leaders and, and patiently uh, convince them that actually this is in your best interest. You'll have a better future than you can ever imagine. Next slide, please. Fortunately, with this method, um, the, the environment responds very, very quickly. Within a year, the trees had grown rapidly. Wildlife began to return. Flooding stopped. People had access to fuel wood, fodder, and many other benefits as well. Ne next slide. The risk of flood and drought uh, was greatly diminished. And so this increased people's confidence to invest in improved agricultural techniques. Within six years of restoring that mountain, this historically food aid dependent community sold 106 tons of grain to the World Food Programme. So nature-based solutions are just so incredibly powerful. And what I love about it, this is something that the community goes on with even, even beyond the life of our intervention. It doesn't create dependency. Next slide. 
beyond ecosystem restoration, what I see when I have the privilege of going back into these communities is the restoration of hope. So people who felt like hopeless victims of climate change and poverty, now they have hope for the future and it's within their means, using the natural abundance all around them to create that better future that they want for themselves and their family. They educate their children, they make wise investments in agriculture and in their, their homesteads. And that pressure, that negative pressure to unsustainably plunder nature is lifted because now they have the ability to make a dignified living for themselves. Over to you, Sarah, thank you. Thanks, Tony. Um, go ahead, Charlotte. <laughs> Great. Thank you for those, uh, that story, Tony. It's a, a wonderful story of hope returning. Um, we're going to move, um, what I'm going to do, because we're over time a little bit, um, for the Q&A, uh, I'd like people to put their questions in the Zoom chat, and then we'll answer them as we go along, um, because I'm more interested in us being able to do a bit of small group work. Um, so we're going to move uh, into some small groups um, uh, just now, where we're going to talk a little bit more about what nature-based solutions means to each of us, and then we're going to come back into plenary and share that. So. Um, Toa, I think, is going to um, magically put us into uh, to three rooms, um, be facilitated by myself, Tony and Sarah. But before, um, before we do that, I just want to explain a little bit about the tool that we're going to use, which is Retro Tool. Um, it's a very simple, intuitive tool. Um, but basically, um, what we need to do is um, when you go in your room, there'll be a link in the chat to the Retro Tool, which you'll open in your browser. Um, and there'll be two sections in there. There'll be a private section and a public section. Um, so put the retro tool link into your search engine. Um, then you, it's like a, a post-it note. So you write on the post-it note, put your name first or your initials first, write your suggestion on there, and then you publish it by clicking the publish now button on there. If you're having any issues when you get into the rooms, um, your facilitators will help you. But I'll hand over to Toa now. And we're going to get popped into our individual Zoom rooms for the next 15 minutes. Hello everyone still being in the main room. Would you like me to put you in relevant rooms or you don't want to join a uh, breakout room? Hi, Kevin. Everyone is, jo is just studying the breakout room, so I will send you to one of the rooms.
Hi, John and Stephen. Um, everyone uh, in this workshop is joining the breakout rooms. Do you want me to send you to breakout rooms? Or you That's want to stay please. here? Yeah? No problem. Hi, Cornelio. Welcome to the workshop. Everyone in the workshop is joining um, the breakout rooms and it will finish in 10 minutes. They've just started five minutes ago. Do you want me to send you to the one of the breakout rooms? Hi, Jesslyn.
Hi, Jackie. Hi, Mukunda. We are just waiting for the groups to finish their discussion in the breakout room. They should be back in two minutes. Do you want to join one of the rooms, by any chance? Um, yeah, sure. Um, sorry, I just came in. I, I was in another group, so and I saw this, so I thought <laughs> I'll just I'll, I'll go and see what the discussions are. Um, okay. Welcome back, everyone. I think everyone's coming back. Um, I'll just check how many people are back. We've got 18, 20 going up and up. So we'll just wait just a couple more seconds. So I hope you found that worthwhile. I know it's quick fire. It's like a post-it brainstorm kind of session. Um, certainly our group um, got lots of, um, lots of ideas. So we're going to share them now. Um, I'm going to hand over to Sarah McKenzie, um, who can ably take us through some reflections on that uh, that quick fire session in our little breakout rooms. <laughs> Thanks, Charlotte. Um, I was wondering if we might go in reverse, so starting with group three, which I think was Tony's group. So Tony, would you or someone from your group like to provide some reflections, please? Thank you. We, we had a mini debacle. I couldn't post the... Um, the link to the tool in there, but we had a wonderful discussion. And I'll, I'll share a little bit. I was taking notes as I was listening, but if, if any of the people in my group want to add to what I say, please jump in. Um, so nature-based solutions really need to be tightly linked with social outcomes. And um, th th this needs to be a very strong link and uh, along a similar vein with livelihoods. As, as much as people might, might or might not appreciate nature, while you're trying to make a living and put food on the table, it's very hard to focus on that. So you need to make that link. And it certainly resonates with my, our own experience in World Vision. Um, there was an example from the Philippines, um, uh, Climate Action Division, how to launch environmental initiatives. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, John, if you wanna add to that, I didn't quite catch the rest of it. 
Thank you, Tony. Now, I was just sharing about our youth nonprofit in the urban setting, and we have been trying our best to like think of the best environmental projects we should be launching since we're quite far off the, the mountains, the seas, etc. So if anyone has thoughts around it, um, please feel free to pop in the chat. And also, I guess, um, so I was talking to a friend who, who is trying to do a river rehabilitation also in the city, and he was sharing that the people that, uh, do not have a buy-in with it, not because they don't care. Um, apparently, they're being affected because there's a lot of flooding, there's a lot of rains here in the Philippines, and it gets flooded every time. But then again, it's not really close to their stomach. They're really more concerned about the food that they're going to be eating um, on a day-to-day -day basis, as mentioned by Tony. Sorry. Thank you. And if, if I can just move to the second point, which which is where we stopped, actually, we didn't get to do the, the third question. But interestingly, if I were to put a, a summary word on it, it's about mindset change. So barriers exist in the nature-based uh, solution uptake. What, what's your opinion on that? And it, just to put in a nutshell, it's about mindset change. And so we talked about, uh, there was an example from park management where they do this past, present, future exercise and get people to visualize where they're heading and then use that tool to, to bring discussion about change, what needs to change and what future do you want to work for? And um, using different language, shift from security-based mindset to sustainability type mindset and thinking about legacy and intrinsic goals. So all, all of these things, uh, I, I think it, it, it links back to what we were talking about before on mindset. Thanks, Sarah. Beautiful. Thanks, Tony. Um, I'll do a really quick overview of our group uh, and then hand over to Charlotte. So I just want to acknowledge the fantastic range of knowledge and skills we had in our group. Um, I learned a lot as well. Uh, in terms of nature-based solutions addressing societal challenges, um, some really great nuanced discussions that yes, there is potential, but we don't want this to become a flavour of the month thing or a silver bullet or put all these expectations on because that will only serve to harm nature-based solutions as an um, approach if it doesn't end up solving everything. Uh, that was Veronica and David had some beautiful reflections from Botswana about uh, elephant and farmer relationships and how nature-based solutions, you know, can help address that. Um, barriers, uh, definitely looking at donor attitudes, um, attitudes towards climate change, how we can take a more systemic view and systemic thinking when addressing this. Um, and how people treat nature, their attitudes towards nature being a really big factor. Uh, and we didn't get time for including nature based in our work, but if anyone wants to add anything, please, please do. And thank you again. Um, I really, really enjoyed my time with our group. Over to you, Charlotte. I think you're still on mute, Charlotte. Sorry, there was eight of us in our group and um, it was fantastic to hear lots of ideas. Um, so yeah, we, we, we talked about um, nature-based solutions being, to, uh, being able to address lots of uh, challenges, including climate change, food security, livelihoods, disasters. And then we had some examples like, you know, uh, protecting coastline from storm surges through mangroves, um, helping reduce flash flood damages, et cetera. Um, we also talked about the barriers, which is the second one. Um, a lot of a lot of uh, comments around lack of awareness of what nature-based solutions are um, and the technologies and methodologies you might use. Um, this idea that the mindset thing around you know seeing nature as separate um, and therefore more to be exploited rather than worked with. So this same similar to what the other two groups were saying. Um, sometimes a lack of education um, from you know from government down to community level as well. And the language, um, uh, you know, misunderstandings around language as well, um, and then community uh, politics and um, expectations being a barrier. So lots of um, examples there. In terms of ideas, which is the third one, um, so obviously um, thinking about our development uh, projects and thinking all the time, what could we do with nature to help solve that problem, rather than automatically going back to the, you know, the usual but thinking about how could we include nature in, in our work? 
Um, then we had some very specific examples around um, uh, uh, plantations, uh, reforestation of flood prone, prone areas, agroforestry, top food security and, and agriculture, uh, urban gardens, um, some ideas like that. But basically we came back to this idea that um, a lot of it is around training and education around what nature-based solutions are and changing people's mindsets about how to work with nature rather than against it. And then we had uh, five of the eight people pop their names down to say they'd like to, to learn a bit more about nature-based solutions. So if you didn't get a chance to do that um, in your group, um, please pop your uh, email address in the chat now because we'll follow up with everybody um, who's on, the, on this uh, session um, afterwards because we do want to do a lot more work on nature-based solutions and we're super interested to hear what uh, what others are doing and how we could work together on that. So, yeah, great. I know it was fast, quick fire, but that's the brainstorm. Um, and, um, yeah, so thank you, everybody. So back to you, Sarah. Thanks, Charlotte. So just to close us out, uh, we just wanted to uh, reference two resources for you. So one of them is the FMNR hub. So our attitude with this practice we've spoken about today is that it does not belong to Tony, it does not belong to World Vision, it is something for the global good. And so we try to make as many of our resources um, on this practice free and accessible to people. You'll find our FMNR manual um, and other guidance on fmnrhub.com. Also the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. We're an official partner uh, and we're also going to be sharing our FMNR and other ecosystem restoration practices on this platform. Um, I can see we've got a couple more minutes and I think there might be a few questions coming in. So let me stop sharing my screen. But Charlotte and Tony, if you want to jump into any of those questions, please go ahead. I can't see them yet. Um, actually, at the moment, people are just popping their names down. So that's oh, awesome. great. <laughs> but in the last two minutes, um, we had a lady in my group who's from Bhutan um, talking about what could they do in highland areas, so areas that are quite um, high but very poor quality soils, et cetera. What are some of the nature-based solutions? And we said we'd take that offline. But if anyone wants to, to throw something out there that might help, um, help with that situation, that would be great. But otherwise, if you've got any more questions, please unmute and let us know. No questions. Well, um, we can certainly um, close early, but thanks everyone for popping your names um, down in the chat. Um, uh, I will pop my uh, email address in the chat as well, so that anyone who has any questions, um, they can send them direct, um, direct to myself and um, we can connect. Um, but we will be in contact um, for those who are interested in learning more um, after today. Um, it is the, this year is the, the start of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. Um, anyone and everyone can be involved. There's no age limit. Um, and um, we feel that if uh, an organisation like World Vision um, is involved in the UN Decade, it'd be great to see lots of other organisations doing similar things that are benefit to people and the planet. So thank you, everyone. Have a lovely rest of the day and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks, everyone.